Welcome to another episode of BuddyCast. Folks, Yay! we have a great one today. Let me tell you, I've got my list here, and this lady has done it all. From comedy work to missionary work. This woman's incredible, so I can't wait to get this show on the road. I introduce to you my new friend, Bueno. How are you doing today? I'm fine, Nick, although a bit cold in Wales. Yeah, it's cold here in Erie, too, so. I bet. You know how you feel. We're getting into that season. I soon, know. We'll the, soon we'll see the white stuff on the ground. We don't get much of that. We just get rain. But that's like why you. Wales is beautiful and green. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about Wales. Well, Wales from top to bottom is about 200 miles long, but we have the most spectacular scenery in the entire world in such a small place. We have fabulous beaches, incredible um countryside really long lush flowing meadows we have incredible coastline we have fabulous mountains up in the snowdonia mountain range we have everything that you could want to live in a really beautiful place apart from the fact that we have a lot of rain uh, uh we don't have quite as much rain as ireland but we do have a lot of rain we have our own language which is the welsh language and i grew up being a mother tongue Welsh speaker and I'm mm. passionately proud to be a Welsh speaker and I try everything possible to try and promote it and have done lots of things over the years. So mm. there's Wales for you in a nutshell. Nice. You know, one part about Wales that you told me about that I'm really ecstatic <laughs> over is St. Uh, David. Oh, yes. I believe you wrote the anthem for that day. Well, let me tell you a little bit about who St. David is. He was um, uh, a monk who uh, grew up in Pembrokeshire, in St. David's, where I also grew up. Mm -hmm. And uh, he performed miracles. For example, he transformed someone's sight. Uh, apparently, when he was born, he, uh, his mother, um, the, the rock was slashed in two by a bolt of lightning, and he was born on that particular day. He went to a place and uh, he stood on a little piece of ground and the ground raised up underneath him. And so he's our patron saint. We celebrate St. David's Day on March the 1st. Now up until a certain time, what we did on March the 1st, we had something called an Eisteddfod. So every single school had an Eisteddfod, which means cultural festival. So what would happen is that the kids would go into the school hall, they'd have singing competitions, they'd have recitation competitions, and that would be the way that they would um, um, uh, celebrate predominantly in the schools. The children would dress up in little Welsh costumes and the little girls would have chimney, uh, black chimney hats and wear uh, little costumes made out of um, breath in which is like tapestry material and the boys would wear culottes and little flat hats but nowadays they wear uh, red rugby jerseys so that's how we used to celebrate it and essentially uh, there was another a couple of elements we used to have something called cowl kenning which is uh, leek soup and also pick out of mine which are little uh, tasty uh, little cakes with uh, raisins or currants in them Ooh. and that would be about it really but in 2004, some people had got together and they had organized a parade for St. David's Day. And mm -hmm. that was held in Cardiff. It was the National St. David's Day Parade. I didn't hear about it until the, the year afterwards. And I joined uh, the parade. And when I was walking along on in 2005, I was banging a bell, which was called uh, Bangi, which was a direct model of the uh, sort of bell that St. David used to have uh, ringing. It was a metal bell with a wooden clapper and I was banging this and I was thinking, we need a song. So as I'm a songwriter, I came up with an idea for a song. It literally hit me like a bolt of lightning. I was uh, just walking up a street in Cardiff and it was directly opposite Cardiff Market, which is where one of our great heroes was hanged for um, corruption. And uh, so I went away, I wrote the, uh, the words in, in English and in Welsh, and I'll tell you why in a second. I took them to my songwriting partner at the time, Hewen Thomas, and I said, I want a song that can be sung by children, by choirs, uh, can be played by, um, by orchestras and brass bands, 
can be uh, performed in Wales, can be performed anywhere. And she came up with the music. Uh, we then took it to the parade committee. And the next year, Helen played the piano and I sang the song. And since that time, it's been adopted and taken on board by lots of people. Um, the manuscript is now available in Cardiff in a place called uh, Tikerv and that's in the Millennium Centre. So it's come an awful long way in those 15 years, this anthem for St David's Day, and I'm very mm -hmm. proud. Hailwen didn't want to um, have anything to do with the development of it, but I did. I, want, I could see that it could go places. And as a result of that, it's also created uh, three, it's become a, a part of three county banners that I've instigated, one for Pembrokeshire, one for Carmarthenshire, and one for Montgomeryshire. And they're all based on the words and images of the St David's Day Anthem words. And they're now taken, there are parades all over Wales. By now there are about 22 parades on St David's Day. And uh, it's a bit of a, a short story to, to tell you uh, what has happened because obviously it just didn't happen like that. It was a tremendous amount of voluntary work and organisation, but the song has been central in the growth of all of these things. It's the only thing that you can use to create your own celebration anywhere. And it's been performed in Canada, in Los Angeles, in Patagonia, in South America, Disneyland Paris, Houses Ooh. of Parliament, St David's Cathedral. Uh, it's been performed all over the place. So I'm extremely proud of that. And uh, uh, I have to say that there's um, all of the details about that is in a, a little book. It's, in a, it's a Welsh book and it says uh, today, yesterday and St David's Day. And this is a picture there of Hilwen and myself, the oh. children on the parade. And there you have the county banner, the Pembrokeshire county banner there. Mm -hmm. Uh, we also have the Carmarthenshire banner and the Montgomeryshire banner, and that is the very first school banner which went into a national uh, history museum, which is called St Fagans, and that went in there last year. So I'm very, very proud of all the work that I've done because it's all been voluntary. There hasn't been any payments, but I've done it because I feel passionately about the Welsh language and I, I said that I'd done two versions. We only have 20% of all people in Wales who speak Welsh, but I also feel that there are the other 80% feel passionately about being Welsh, and it's for those people that I wrote an English version. So there, there are specific areas in Wales where the Welsh language isn't as strong, uh, predominantly in South Pembrokeshire, which is where I'm from. So if they chose to sing the St David's Day Anthem, there is a, a version that they can sing, although the definitive version is the Welsh language one. That was beautiful. Thank you. Really awesome. It's really awesome. I like how you wanted it to be a song for everyone, not just one of those, like, not just another church song or another, like, you know, uh, adult song or some so you wanted to be for kids too that was oh beautiful. no it had to be it had to be for kids because the yeah. thing is see now what they do is they uh, uh several schools actually have a parade around the school with their school banners the Ooh. one i've shown you there they have school banners or they'll have class banners they will sing the St. David's Day Anthem. They will go then and all their parents will be outside and they'll be uh, willing them on and say, yes, so there's my little Johnny. And so they'll go into the classroom and then they will have their service. They'll have their picking on uh, pick out of mine, their Welsh cakes, and then they will also have their Estevod. And so it's now a bolt-on tradition that all the schools in Wales can actually use if they so choose. Nice. That yeah. was a fun school day for me, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, speaking of your proud work, you are also an author, am I correct? I am. Yes, tell us about your book. Well, okay, I've got the book here. Uh, look at that. It's called Stand Up and Sock It to Them, Sister. Uh, we're in the process at the moment of uh, changing the, um, the, the publishers. So it is available um, on Amazon at the moment, although how long it will be, I don't know. Um, but it's uh, uh, an in-depth study of women in 
comedy. I started it as a master's um, uh, project when I was doing a master's degree in women's studies back in 1994-96. And at that time, we had to look at women working in a non-traditional environment. So that was an environment which was predominantly male, but there were women making progress in that direction. And one of my passions, I have loads of them, so we can talk all day. Uh, one of my passions is comedy. And uh, I wanted uh, to look at uh, stand-up comedy because I'd done lots of comic roles in my, my working life as a performer, but I hadn't done any stand-up comedy because I, I didn't know how to do it. I was a bit scared. I thought it was, oh, my God, I can't do this. So I just wanted to find out what were the barriers? Why were there so few women doing it? There were At that time, there was about 15, 10 to 15% uh, female uh, stand-up comics. Now, although now in Britain you have way more people generally doing stand-up comedy, the figure is no different now to, to what it was then, which is 10 to 15 percent. So I wanted to find out what the barriers were stopping women from uh, being successful in this um, medium. And um, I could have used any any uh, profession. I could have used um, education, politics, architecture, uh, whatever. I could have chosen anything, the law. I could have chosen anything at all because the glass barrier is the glass ceiling in any profession. So what I did find out was um, what's stopping women from progressing, end of although it was about women in comedy. Now, I started off with five people in the 1996, uh, and that grew to 94 people that I eventually um, interviewed, 65 of whom were female stand-up comics working on the comedy scene. One of them has became a, um, become a really good friend, and she's called Tanya Lee Davis, and she's a small person. She calls herself a midget, and I know that some people find that offensive, but she calls herself a midget, and uh, we've been friends for a good 15 years now, I think, mm -hmm. and uh, she, is, she is such a phenomenal role model. Uh, she just travels the world extensively, and I'm very, very proud to know her. And That's she's a great right. friend. Yeah. Hey, speaking of friends, you and me have a mutual friend in common. Yes, Mr. we do. Yeah. Lou. So know him. Lovely Lou. Yes. Well, I've never met Lou, um, uh, mm. unfortunately, but I hope to meet him before long. Uh, I hope our paths will cross, because uh, I've become very fond of him. And... Basically, um, one of the people I interviewed for the book was called um, Jeff Scott, and he's the resident pianist and MC at the world famous comedy store on Sunset Boulevard. And he was very helpful because he enabled me to uh, get in contact with people like Tanya Lee Davis, who then helped me with other people. Uh, so Lou, um, Jeff was very, very, very crucial for the book because he gave me a way in to American comics. And so I'm very grateful to Jeff for that. Now, when the book came out, um, I I told Jeff and I told him about him. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this guy called Lou Deck contacted me. And he said that he was one of um, the original comics in uh, the comedy store. He was one of Mitzi Shaw's boys. And he had been a professional performer for Oh, many, many years, probably around 40. I'm not quite sure, really. Um, and he had so many accolades to his name. And he said he absolutely loved the book. And uh, since that time, he's become my comedy guru. And we talk on a regular basis. And um, that's where the friendship started, really. So uh, we, we have a, um, a regular little chats on Zoom. And um, I hope one day that... Either he will come to Britain or I will go over there. So mm. that's how it started. But he is quite prolific and he has been so good at mentoring people. And he also has written a book about comedy, but the intricacies and the ins and outs of how to do it. Whereas this is, my book is more to what barriers have people overcome? And mm. also really interesting stories about their lives. 
So it's a different sort of book that we've written. Um, so that's how I met him. Well, I have met him. <laughs> that yeah. was awesome. Truly amazing. Lou's a great guy. He really is. He's that guy. Yeah. He's that guy that would really stand up for you, but at the same time would, you know, isn't afraid to go do his own thing. You know, isn't afraid to go up in stage and do his own spiel. But then again, be on the side stage mentoring you. You see what I did up there? See how I did it? That's yeah. what you need to do. Yeah. Speaking of performing, um, you yourself have done a tad bit of comedy and a, also a one woman show. Yes, about, I have. Yes, let's talk about the show. I believe it's a show about a French singer slash performer. Am I correct? Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, she was at one time pretty famous in America. Her name is Edith Piaf. And mm -hmm. when I went to Belgium in the late 70s, early 80s, I went there to be an au pair. And then I started singing with some uh, French Hungarian brothers who'd been born in Paris, who lived in Belgium and were totally passionate about Celtic music. And I sang with them. And because I didn't have a full time job at the time, I was teaching English in, as a foreign language. But I also started busking. So when I was busking, I heard about this French singer and she was called Edith Piaf. And I read about her and I thought, well, if she can do it, I could do it. So that was when my love affair with edith piaf began probably when i was about 22 and i read about her i heard about her music i went to Père Lachaise to her uh, to the grave and that's when it all started to take a hold of me really now when i came back to britain i came back in 1983 and that was it was because my brother was dying unfortunately of hodgkin's disease and what was quite ironic was that when I was in Belgium, I often used to sing Welsh songs because I, I bought a guitar, taught myself how to play guitar and uh, went and sang in restaurants and also on the street. And when I came back here, what was ironic was that they wanted me to sing in French. So I was um, I started singing French songs. I was singing in an international cabaret and singing some Italian, some Spanish, some German and some French songs. As a result of that, I was invited to sing, um, take the role of Edith Piaf in a theatre performance. And that had tremendous accolades. And as a result of that somebody asked me will you come and do that show up in north wales i said well i can't do that show because the show no longer exists it's been disbanded but you did, did it for a week and then it finished and she said oh please will you come i've heard it's such great things about it and i said oh well i'll write one then and i've never written anything in my life <laughs> nothing I mean, I've been, I'd, I'd written little plays for kids in because I used to direct theatre and education as well. So I'd written plays for kids and I'd written a few lyrics, but they weren't very good. And anyway, so I thought, oh, well, OK, I'll write a woman, one woman show. So I wrote a one woman show and I performed it. And that was back in 1989. And it was extremely well received, extremely well received. And I did it um, a little um, here and there around Wales. And then life got in the way. I ended up having uh, my daughter and um, changed direction because um, when you get your mid 30s as a woman, up until that time, I had plenty of work as a performer, as an actor, uh, doing theatre and education, doing films through the medium of Welsh, all sorts of things, radio, television. There was loads to do. And then by the time you get to 35, then there is far less work for women and that was something i'd worked out for in this book as well but i actually had first-hand experience myself so that's why i went to university to do a master's degree because i wanted to make films about women so uh so everything got, got put to one side i forgot about the show and everything else um so did the master's degree, uh, changed direction, went to do equal opportunities work for 10 years, didn't do an awful lot of performance, just every now and again, people would say, oh, will you come and sing? Will you come and do this? And I, I did, but it wasn't much. Anyway, a, two years ago now, I had a really um, very nasty, unpleasant, life-changing experience. I was rushed into hospital with tremendous pains on my chest. 
And to cut a long story short, I had pulmonary embolisms. That's blood clots on my lungs. And uh, I was misdiagnosed for three weeks. And in that time, or I, not really at that time, because I was too ill. But coming out of that, and then I broke four ribs and I was in bed on morphine for a long time. So I actually thought, we're not guaranteed here, you know. Um, I'd lost my brother at the age of 23 and I'd always gone, I have to make the most of every day. But I got to a point then where I started thinking, if I've only got a, a year to live, what do I want to do? And I thought, I want to do my one woman show. So I worked really hard, tidied it up, uh, rewrote parts of it. I couldn't do it as a one woman show per se anymore because uh, physically I changed, I'd had uh, problems, so I couldn't perform it in the same way as previously. So I rewrote it and um, eventually found a really fantastic production company and we put a show together and we went up last year to London. We went to the West End and performed in a place called Café Zeda, which is the most incredibly beautiful um, brasserie you can find outside of Paris. And it was a sellout and I had a standing ovation and uh, two encores. Uh, as a result of that, we had four or five other shows. And this year was going to be my year of performing in throughout Britain, potentially New York, hopefully. I would have wanted to go back to a place I performed in, which was called uh, Don't Tell Mama. I wanted to sing in places like Glastonbury, the festival there, and also the Edinburgh Fringe Festival and uh, on sing on cruises all of this was doable all of this was doable and then covid happened so no more performing this year but i have to keep believing that um that next year potentially or maybe the year after and um who knows but I am with with the right people at this point in time. They are fantastic. They've been so supportive. And we made a little film. Uh, so you can Google it. The show is called Passionate About Piaf. We want to travel. We want to go uh, as far as we potentially can. I, I sang in a place called Don't Tell Mamas in New York, which is off Broadway. And I sang a couple of Piaf songs there. And... Um, I came to America, I've been twice. I came, I think about 10 years ago, and then the other time was about five years ago. And five years ago, we came to Scranton, which is in Pennsylvania, and there was something called the North America Estevod, and I, that word again, so it's a cultural festival. So I came to Scranton with the choir that I sang with, and so I'd already sung in Don't Tell Mamas, and I think that would be the ideal place to come and perform uh, Passionate About Piaf. So if you're interested, Google mm. and get in touch with Multi Show Productions because they're the, the group that are running the show. But it talks about her life. It, um, she led a life of abject misery. She started singing on the street when she was seven years of age. She was accused of murder. She had a, a child when she was 17 who died. She conquered America. She was very famous throughout America at one time. She played at uh, Carnegie Hall. She had nine standing ovations there. She also performed in Cuba. So, you know, she is an icon and I love singing her songs. And I don't try and uh, uh, be like her. I just perform them as I, you know, to, to, it is a tribute to her, but it's not... Um, when I was trying to be Piaf, because I'm not. I, there's only one Piaf. There'll only ever be one Piaf. That was beautiful. I hope to see that show one day. Yeah. One it loads out on the, on the web. Go and check it out. Yes, I will. Now, one thing that you told me when we chatted beforehand that really got me excited about this was you've done some mission work. Am I correct? Well, we don't call it that here mm. in Britain. and um, um, But I, I take it that mission means charity yes well we're always brought up because you know we're, we're a christian society and i went to the chapel when i was a child and always was always um brought up to 
to do charitable things, you know, and to help people. And I've always tried to do those things. Well, so throughout my life, I've done things like um, I've run um, half marathons and raised money for different charities. Uh, I've sponsored children. I've always sponsored girls because I'll tell you why. Years ago, I went to Morocco and we were in Marrakesh and uh, a door opened and I could see this tiny child. She couldn't have been more than about three or four. And she was making carpets at that age. And it just really hurt me at that time to see a child who should have been thinking about potential, well, should have been playing, but maybe potentially going to school. So I've always um, wanted to sponsor children and I've done it for a very long time. And there was one child I sponsored for about five years in Southeast Asia who I went out to visit. Uh, she was called or, um, uh, Endang Lukita Ningram. And then there was another young uh, girl who I sponsored from the age of eight, and she was called Oraling Urbina Malaspin. And I sponsored her for 10 years in uh, Nicaragua, and she became a doctor. And mm -hmm. the most amazing thing happened last year. Uh, were I, as part of a television program. She's now moved to Spain and she's trying to find work there as a doctor. And last year I took part in a television program when, when I met her for the very first time and it was just so wonderful. And we're in touch with um, with Facebook, we're in touch with uh, WhatsApp. In fact, this morning we were going to do a Zoom but she didn't have Wi-Fi. So that's mm -hmm. something I felt very strongly about because had she not been sponsored, she would probably still be, you know, working in a, in a clothes shop. Her mother works, you know, she worked as a cleaner. So, you know, to give somebody that potential is just so, such a wonderful thing to be able to do. Um, another thing I do is I need scarves for the homeless. Mm. And I call them rainbow scarves. So if anybody's interested in finding out more about that, um, Google well, no, Rainbow Scarves on Facebook. Uh, there's also, I started um, developing a women's leadership project with a place called Kakuma Refugee Camp in Kenya. And we've had a couple of false starts because um, the technology that we, we need is, is not really where we need it to be. But the whole idea, again, is to work with uh, female development because I am passionate about developing women to their full potential and that's what I do as a coach uh, and my coaching is another thing I'm passionate about because I love opening doors for people I love enabling people to be the best uh, possible form of themselves and I, I love destroying those uh, uh, false beliefs that people have about what their capabilities are and showing them that they can do whatever they set their mind to if they really truly truly want to that was beautiful it does sound like you've done a lot of charity work i love that you're continuing it you've told me you're setting up something you're setting up a refugee camp and that's what we need no no no, oh, no. The, the refugee camp has been set up it is oh. uh, it is probably the third largest in the world. It is huge. It is absolutely huge. Wow. Um, yeah, it's there. That is there. But what I want to be doing is I want to be coaching by Zoom and coaching potential female leaders. And um, one of the things I do with my coaching is I've, I'm a passionate believer that if you're um, a great leader, you will also be a great public speaker. So those two things are entwined. And I do a lot of uh, public speaking coaching for potential leaders. Yeah. And this is what my aim is to be doing with uh, the Kakuma uh, camp is to enable women to take their roles of leadership in the camps and enable those women to be fantastic role models for younger women. Um, so that's what I want to achieve, but that could be in the next three years. It won't be overnight, especially at the moment, because everybody is so, so um, stultified. And so uh, they're just really locked in with the, the COVID. So I can't go anywhere. Cardiff is under uh, lockdown. Mm. So it does really limit you tremendously. Mm -hmm. One thing I always ask my buddies who come on this show is, if you could have our audience donate to one charity of 
your choice, what would it be and why? It would be a cancer charity. Uh, it would be the one based in Wales because I, um, I lost my brother to Hodgkin's disease many years ago. Uh, I raised lots of money for in, the Imperial uh, Cancer Research Fund and also I do Race for Life and stuff like that. But the money doesn't stay in Wales. It goes out of Wales. And I want that money, if people were wanting to uh, contribute to a fund, that they contribute to something that stays in this country. Um, uh, Wales and Pennsylvania have a very close link, really, because a lot of Welsh people went to Pennsylvania. Uh, which is something we can talk about in a, in a minute maybe but mm -hmm. so for me it would be a cancer research fund uh, we have a hospital here called Valindra and my sister was unfortunate enough to have uh, bowel cancer but fortunately she came through it so two members of my close family have had cancer a very uh, wonderful friend uh, died of uh, cancer recently um, my mother and father-in-law died of cancer it's come close to i've had cancer on my nose you know um it's one in four of us will get it and one in three of us i think will die of it or is it the other way around i can't remember but mm -hmm. um yeah that's awesome that's awesome that you want to give something that's been impacting your family you know that you you're passionate about it. you're not just yeah let's just give it to the kids or whatnot you know no no something that no. you it's something that's truly impacted you and that you've put your heart and soul into. That's what I love about this show. Yeah. When people yeah. have those types of charities. One thing I wanted to also ask you was, um, you're, you mentioned this earlier, your public speaking and leadership. Yeah. Oh, let's talk about that. Well, as I said, uh, I think leadership and public speaking go hand in hand. And during the lockdown uh, time, uh, Obviously, I wasn't going to be doing a huge amount of public speaking, um, coaching or, or any sort of training this year because that, that what I wanted to do was to go out and perform, get it out of my system once and for all and be happy that I've taken it as far as possible. But that wasn't possible. So the very first day we went into lockdown, I thought, how can I help others and how can I help myself? Because I'm not very good at um, not doing anything. I'm not very good at all at just sitting still. So I decided I was going to do something called the Alternative BBC, the Bathroom Broadcasting Coach. So I found the only wall that is clear in my house, and that was the wall in the bathroom. So I did bite-sized chunks of, um, of uh, coaching to anybody that they could use them wherever they are in the world. And that's if, they, if you Google hash, um, tag the Alternative BBC, um, hashtag bathroom broadcasting coach that will bring up lots of bite-sized coaching tips but going back to what your original question was because I have a very nasty habit of going off tangent <laughs> I'm aware of it but so I've also during lockdown time I've created um, a foolproof method of coaching anybody anywhere anytime any place through zoom on public speaking. I'm not going to tell you how it works because otherwise people will go off and uh, use my methodology, which I'm not sharing <laughs> because I want to work with all you people out there. But it does work and I've had tremendous results. I love it. I've done, um, I've also worked with Skype. I've worked with uh, people in Los Angeles, uh, also Chicago, um, Luxembourg. So I do all sorts of things, really. Uh, it's my coaching is very tailor made. So, for example, there might be somebody who wants who's just had a new job. They're facing things like they don't know how to, um, you know, be assertive. They don't know how to, type, uh, you know, work with their time assertively, uh, give orders, all of those things that make a good um, um, leader, leader. I will work on them. Um, trying to find out where their, their weaknesses are, and then we work on those issues. Um, I've run courses with um, huge groups, uh, with the Royal College of Nursing, the National Union of Teachers, all sorts of environments where I do things like uh, how to network effectively, assertiveness courses, bullying and harassment, um, public speaking, conference courses, all of those things. But what I really want to work on now is the Zoom coaching because 
it doesn't make any sense to do it any other way it's very effective you don't have to travel you don't have all of the hassle you can work with anybody anytime anywhere and it really really works so so long as you've got an internet connection i can work with anybody anywhere where you know whether that's pennsylvania chicago you know i mean i zoom very often with lou i um i haven't zoomed recently with uh, jeff scott but i zoom all the time with people it's so wonderful so that's one thing one of the um the silver linings of this crisis there aren't many but it is it's forced us to think of new ways of working that where we can actually be in contact with people but from our own homes and i like that very much because um i like traveling as much as the next person but only if i find something interesting at the end of it i don't particularly want to be traveling up to london to deliver some coursework where i could be doing that here so it saves a lot of time Ooh. i'm losing sorry I, I, sorry I had myself muted oh, because the dog was right okay. here. where can we find the these courses like how can if someone were interested in taking some of these courses what would they, they have would google to do gwenodavid.co.uk mm -hmm. or you could google That's you could just google youtube gwenodavid because there's loads and loads of testimonials there there's a bite-sized um alternative comedy um, the bite-sized alternative bbc is there uh as uh lots of stuff about my coaching um i just did a thing last week on television where i was um doing an item about empty nesters because they're going back to college and some people don't quite know how to deal with that so there's tons of stuff out there on both um uh, youtube gweno david and www.gwenodavid.co.uk Plus, I'm also on LinkedIn, plus I'm on Facebook. And the other thing I did on Facebook was I set up a group called Gweno David Leadership and Public Speaking Coach. And what I was doing there, and that might be helpful for some of you um, viewers, is I put all sorts of free uh, resources there, things that you could use uh, that could keep you going throughout this crisis because some of us don't do well on our own. And we need to have things to keep us busy um i'm always busy uh and to be honest i haven't had an opportunity to look at any of those things i put up there mm -hmm. now one thing that you mentioned before and i think this is a really 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 great fact you have a particularly distant relative that has a connection here to the united states where i am yep absolutely maybe not quite in in your state but not mm. far off um, as I mentioned earlier on, a lot of Welsh people came from Wales to Pennsylvania. The reason they came was because um, we had two huge uh, industries in Wales in the last century, and that was the slate, uh, slate quarries and the coal mines. And, of course, in Pennsylvania, you had coal mines. So a lot of coal miners uh, and, um, and the slate workers came from Wales to Pennsylvania, settled there. Some went a bit further into the interior and some of my family uh, went to ohio and um there's a lot of educators in my mother's family my mother's family is called beb and uh they have two big interests apparently the one is politics and the other one is education and one of my um he was uh, the brother of my great 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 grandfather and he set up a little school in ohio and so William Bebb, who later became Governor Bebb of Ohio, was raised and slept in a papoose and uh, the, the local um, indigenous uh, um, people, the children went to the school alongside my, William Bebb and his mother taught the indigenous children in that school. He later became um, a political agent for Abram Lincoln, I believe. And as a result of that, he was rewarded with the governorship of Ohio. There's a big, big park in Ohio called Governor Ohio Park. And um, I would love to go there. And maybe one day I will. I, I didn't realize it was so close to Scranton, really. 
uh, because we were so, so close. But there again, everything in America is not very close anyway. You know, like mm -hmm. when I say close, I mean half an hour down the road. I don't suppose it's that close, is it? Nope. Nope. Not at all. All yeah. right. That was beautiful. I hope to see that park too one day. And I'm glad you have that American tie, you know, that. Yeah. And also there's another family. I don't know if it's the same family or an offshoot of it. It must be the same family because they came to visit my parents in, uh, they lived in Anglesey, which is in North Wales. Check it out. Google it. It's gorgeous. It's wonderful. All of Wales is gorgeous. I am their ambassador. In fact, I am the St. David's Day ambassador for an organization called America Marie. So check that out. Uh, Wales is stunning. You need to come here. You really do. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. It's full of history. It's full of music. It's, oh, we have some tremendous, tremendously talented people here punching way above their, their weight. So anyway, going back to Anglesey. So these people, I think I was about two or three at the time, and these people came over from uh, America. I'm not quite sure where, but they had nurseries and they were a big, big nursery, and they had a, a, a camera which took uh, colour photographs, and my mother still has those photographs to this day, you know, and they were the very first colour photographs that we'd ever seen, so they were, woo! So, yeah. It's really beautiful. Now, I'm going to ask you two questions that I ask all my buddies that come on the show. The first one is, in your own words, how do you define a buddy or a friend? So, someone you can rely on mm -hmm. in good and bad times. I think that covers it all, really. Mm. But I have to say that the next book I'm intending to write is called um, Be a Best Buddy because I do believe that you have to become your own very best friend because you are the only person you will have a relationship with your entire life. So make sure that the relationship you have with yourself is one that you would want your best friend to be. Uh, there's a lot of self-hatred out there, and I've been uh, guilty of it myself in the past, um, but I understand things better now, and I'm not. You know, I, I really love myself. I'm a kind human being. I know who I am. I know where I'm going. So that is not a problem, but for many years it was. And um, I think you really have to have a great relationship with yourself, first of all, before you can be a good friend to anybody else. So, you know, someone that you can rely on in good and bad times. And also it is crucial. You have to have a laugh with them because if you don't have a laugh with them, it's not much fun. Right. And I have a giggle bird, uh, a giggle buddy. And basically... You may have been lucky enough to find a giggle buddy in your life, but I have uh, a giggle buddy and we just crease each other up. Uh, my daughter's a bit of a giggle buddy as well because sometimes you just say something silly and we'll just look at each other and we'll just crease up with laughter. So I think it's all to do with um, becoming happy. Actually, the way to become happy is to make other people happy. So become that friend that you want people um, to have. And you can't go wrong, really. Yes. I love how you started out with it starts with loving yourself. Like the new, like that new Elton John song, I'm going to love me again. You know, just taking, like you said, take care of my very best friend. He was talking about himself. Yeah. Just, you know. Well, you know, your mother and father are, are going to love you to yeah. pieces. They yeah. really are, obviously, with a bit of luck, if you're lucky, because not everybody's parents do love them. I do know people whose parents do not love them. Mm -hmm. But there is no feeling in this world, like when your child is born, you would kill for that human being. So those two people will love you and your flaws, whatever, but they will leave you at some point, you know? So mm -hmm. you are the only person you will ever have a long, lifelong relationship with. So make it a good one. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to ask you this last question. I call it the ultimate buddy cast buddy question. With you, I'm having a little trouble uh, dig you know, digesting this because you've got so much going on for you from being an author to doing mission work to just being a performer. I think it all ties down what's your i think it all ties down to what's your advice for the world today like with all that you do 
what's your advice with just like if someone wants to be a performer, a speaker, an author, do comedy, do all that you do. Like I said, I'm having trouble tying it all down to one thing. Like normally I'm. It's like, easy. <laughs> you just never, ever give up. Never, exactly. ever give up. Never. Because those things you want to do, they will make you feel whole. You know, when I'm on stage and I'm entertaining and I'm singing and I just feel completely me you know and 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 i know that it's it's uh, it's not a altogether altruistic because i know that people are enjoying themselves as well but i just am so in my groove you know and why would i ever give up on that i will you know i just have to be patient now i'm gonna have to you know uh, in this time when we've had lockdown i've done something that i never thought i was going to do i've made a film as well you know, and this is a film about Welsh independence, which is again something I'm passionate about. So, uh, and I made a film. I wrote uh, three sets of songs, and it was turned down for a competition. But never give up. Never ever give up. I was. It took me twenty years to get my book, um, and a proper publisher. I was turned down. I don't know how many times. If you think you've got something that you need to share with the world, never ever ever give up never give up i love that <laughs> great advice thanks for helping me sum it all up because i'm like <laughs> normally i ask like a comedian you know what's your advice for upcoming comedians or you know an author what if someone wants to write a book or something but like i said you've got it all going on so but that's a perfect way to summarize everything that you've been through everything that you've done just never give up i, I never do yeah you know, i others may but i don't <laughs> yep. yep never give up i love it all right well thank you so much for being a buddy here on buddy well, you're very welcome and may i suggest that you get in touch with tanya lee davis because i think she'd be a perfect match for your program i, will. I mentioned my name because she is such a really kick-ass woman and mm -hmm. uh so and the other thing i would say as another piece of advice is find your tribe you know find those people who actually believe in what you're doing find your tribe they're out there find your buddies find your buddies indeed yeah. okay yeah. thank you so much i talk you. the hind legs of a donkey as my mother would say however don't i've had a great time <laughs> don't worry about it i love it when my guests chat rather than be just asking a question. So, what's it like being uh, an author? It's nice. Okay. No, I'm not like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Hi, righty. righty. To all my okay. buddies out there, I always leave the episodes with one piece of advice myself go be someone's buddy today. Great advice. Yes. We'll catch you next time here on Buddy Cast. This was my buddy, Gweno. Have a good day, everybody. I'm my buddy, Nick. Mm-hmm.